This time it's five classic scooters. Yes, this time we're going into the dark side. We're looking at scooters. For some people, they're just not bikes. Others, however, absolutely adore the things. I kind of sit on the fence. They are bikes. They are really useful, but they're not as exciting as a full-size bike, usually. But when you've ridden a scooter in winter after riding a normal bike, you realise just how brilliant these things can actually be. They may not have the top speed or the glamour of a big bike, but they do have a level of usefulness that a normal bike simply can't compete with. So here we have five classic scooters. Lambretta. Lambrat is a suburb of Milan. It's named after the Lambro River which flows through the area. And it's from this that the scooters Lambretta get their name. But the story of Lambretta doesn't actually start in Milan. Because it was in 1922 that Fernando Innocenti of Prescia built a steel tubing factory in Rome. In 31 he took his business to Milan where the business expanded until it employed around 6,000 people. However, during World War II the factory was extensively bombed. Post-war there was a considerable need for cheap, reliable transport in Italy, so Innocenti employed an aeronautical engineer, one Corradino di Ascanio, to design a simple and robust vehicle. And just like the designers over at Piaggio, the Ascanio was heavily influenced by the Cushman scooters which the American military had been using to buzz around Italy during and immediately after World War II. Of course, Di Ascanio had something that Cushman didn't. He had Italian flair. Di Ascanio was not a fan of motorcycles, so he wanted to design something that was fundamentally different. Di Ascanio's design used a spar frame and, of course, familiar leg shields, and the engine was mounted directly into the rear wheel. However, Di Ascanio and Ascenti fell out over the design. Di Ascanio wanted a pressed steel frame that was then welded together. And Ascenti, who of course had a business that made steel tubing, wanted the frame to be made from steel tubing. As a result, Di Ascanio would go over to Piaggio, and Piaggio would use his pressed steel frame. And Ascenti would bring over Caproni aircraft designer Cesare Pallavicino to finish the design for him. Luigi Torri was also brought in to design a new engine. And their finished design, the first Lambretta scooter, would arrive on the market in 1947. The design featured a rear pillion seat or an optional storage compartment. The fuel cap was situated underneath the hinge rider seat, an idea of course famously copied by Honda. Although their most famous production line was of course in Milan, the bikes were also produced in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, India and Spain, sometimes of course using different names and sometimes under the Lambretta name. And in the United States, Montgomery Ward will import and sell the Ally 125 under their Riverside brand name. The Lambrettas they produced featured engines ranging from 49 to 198 cc's. Lambrettas biggest model, the GT200, featured a 198 cc piston ported two stroke engine that made around 10.8 horsepower at 5300 rpm. Top speed was quoted at around 60 miles an hour. The final classic Lambrettas were the DL or GP range in the United Kingdom. These were sold between 1969 and 1971 and would be the last produced at the Innocenti factory before it was taken over by British Leyland, who would use the factory to produce minis and somewhat less successfully Austin Allegros before selling the factory on again to Alejandro Di Tommaso who would use it to produce Benelli and Motor Guzzi small block motorcycles. But that wasn't quite the end for Lambretta. Automobile Products of India, API, had begun assembling Innocenti designed Lambrettas in the 1950s beginning with their 50cc model, and API would continue to produce Lambretta-derived scooters right up until 1990. And also in India in 1972, Scooters India Limited, SIL, which was a state-run enterprise based in Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh, bought the entire Lambretta manufacturing trademark rights and most of the machinery from the old Innocenti factory. Production here would peak as high as 35 units per annum, but by the late 80s it had fallen to around 4,500 units per annum with production finally ceasing in 1997. And since 2011, Lambretta badge machines have been produced in Taiwan. These look exactly like the Innocenti machines, and in fact run a modern four-stroke engine with CVT transmission.
the Piaggio of Vespa. During World War II, Piaggio's factory at Pontedero had been heavily bombed by the Allies. In the immediate aftermath of the war, Enrico Piaggio, who was the son of Rinaldo Piaggio, the company's founder, realised there was a dire need for cheap transport. And seeing no future in aeronautical engineering, he decided to construct the company's efforts on motorcycles. In fact, in 1944, Piaggio engineers had already begun work on a motorcycle. But post-war, the Piaggio engineers, just like those at Innocenti, were heavily influenced by the sight of the Cushman being used by the American GIs. However, after an abortive first prototype, the MP5, Piaggio tempted Corridino Diasconio over from rivals in Ascenti. Diasconio's prototype, model MP6, had its engine mounted beside the wheel, rather like he'd done with the Innocenti prototype. He also gave the machine a monocoque or unibody chassis. Although a monocoque design, it did employ a central spar with stress bearing steel outer panels. And this gave the machine this open step through design that would instantly recognise today as a scooter. And in 1946, the first Vespa would see production. The MP6's 98cc two stroke engine had said to buzz and sound like an insect. And this, of course, had given rise to the machine's legendary name Vespa, meaning wasp in Italian. The little engine acted directly onto the back wheel via its transmission gears, so there was no need for a dirty chain. It ran three speeds and a twist grip for control. Lubrication on these early models, of course, being pre-mix. And a major improvement between the prototype and the final production models was, of course, the inclusion of a fan to keep the whole engine nice and cool. Production of the little Vespa ramped up very quickly, from 2,500 in 1947 to 10,000 in 48, 20,000 in 49, and 60,000 by 1950. In 1948, the 98cc model was replaced by a 125, and this model would include rear suspension as well as that enlarged engine, all the early models having had rigid rear ends. In 1959, Piaggio was purchased by the Agnelli family. These were the owners of the Fiat car company. Vespa would thrive under their ownership until 1992, when Giovanni Alberto Agnelli became the CEO. Agnelli was already suffering with cancer at the time and would die in 1997. Since then, the company has changed hands a number of times and has died of death more than once. In fact, it nearly went under in 2003. Although since that time, the company has stabilised and recovered somewhat. Although it began with a single model, Vespa quickly came to symbolise a range of machines rather than a single machine, with various capacities on offer, ranging from 50 to 200 cc's, very much like its Lambretta counterparts. But unlike Lambretta, Vespa would survive into the 70s, or would introduce perhaps its most famous model, the PX, in 1977. Top of the range was the PX200. This used a 200cc, two-stroke engine of course, with four-speed transmission. This made around 12 horsepower, and was good for around 65 miles an hour. In its final form, featuring electronic ignition, the PX200 would run between 1982 and 1999, although the smaller models would continue for a little longer. In its various sizes, the PX range was very much the last of the classic manual transmission Vespers and would indeed feature improvements such as automatic oiling. But this would not be enough to keep the machine going into the modern era. And in 2017, production of all PX models was ended. It would simply been unable to meet the Euro 4 emission regulations. And from that point on, all future Vespers would feature four-stroke engines and CVT transmission. Triumph Tigris and BSA Sunbeam Scooter Rain. Announced in 1958, the Triumph Tigris and its BSA Sunbeam equivalent were BSA Group's attempt to counter the invasion of the Italian scooter. The Triumph and BSA models were essentially the same bike, and this was simply a case of badge engineering. The different models were available in different colours and with different sets of badges. Otherwise, they were pretty much identical. In terms of style, the new bikes were a little way behind the Italian rivals, but not too far. This wasn't a bad looking scooter at all, and engineering terms of it was very different. BSA Group intended these machines to corner well, and they did handle very well indeed by scooter standards, outperforming much of their Italian opposition. 
and engine choice is very interesting too. The smaller model is a 175cc 7.5 horsepower two stroke engine. This was largely based off the Bantam, but of course used forced air cooling. The larger capacity bike was very interesting, however. This used a twin cylinder four stroke engine, although interestingly, it didn't use cross flow heads. The larger model made around 10 horsepower, which is good enough for around 70 miles an hour, with a cruising speed of 55 to 60. And that four stroke engine was more refined and more fuel efficient than its Italian two stroke counterpart. And the spec even included electric start as an option. And on both machines, the four speed gearbox was foot operated. This then fed power to the back wheel by a fully enclosed chain running in its own oil bath. And initially, these surprisingly lightweight machines sold pretty well particularly in 250 form. But unfortunately, build quality and reliability was an issue. It was said that a Tigris was a joy to own as long as somebody else was paying the mechanical bills. But probably the biggest problem for this machine wasn't actually anything to do with its design or build quality, but more the company, or at least the internal politics within the company. Many within Triumph and BSA felt that the machines would dial it the macho image of their brands and so have been vehemently opposed to the development of the machine in the first place. And so in 1965 the naysayers had their way, and the scooter was finally discontinued, after only six years of production, despite reasonable sales and never really achieving its full potential. The Zundap Bella Zundap was a major German manufacturer of cars and of course motorcycles. It was founded in 1917 in Nuremberg by Fritz Niemeyer and Friedrich Krupp of the Krupp Engineering Concern. The company had initially been interested in steelwork of course with that Krupp name behind it. But after World War I, with the demand of weapons grade steel obviously in massive decline in Germany, Niemeyer decided to diversify the company into motorcycle manufacture. And during the 1930s they developed a range of machines which was very much the equivalent of rival BMWs. Although their engine was a flat twin, it was not a boxer like the BMW engine and can sometimes be viewed really as a very wide angle V-twin. But of course in Germany post World War II there was no demand for large capacity motorcycles. So instead they developed the Bella scooter which they introduced in 1953. The Bella used a single cylinder two stroke air cooled engine which was available in a range of sizes from 146 or 198 cc's. The 150 smaller model produced 7.3 horsepower with a top speed of around 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour. The larger 200 made 10 horsepower had a top speed of 75 miles an hour that's about 121 kilometers an hour. The design and style of the machine had said to have been heavily influenced by the Pirilla Greyhound, an Italian design scooter. And like so many of its Italian equivalents, featured a fuel tank mounted under the seat. To aid stability, the machine ran on 12 inch wheels. With early models using telescopic forks, this would later be changed to an Earl's type fork later in the bike's production. And standard for the time, the bike would run a 6 volt electrical system. Although on some later models, this was changed to a 12 volt system in order to power an electric starter. The machine was fairly successful and was exported all over the world, sometimes under different names. For example, in the United Kingdom, it was badged as an ambassador. All versions use a four-speed manual transmission with chain primary drive and chain final drive also. The Bella would prove to be one of Zundap's most popular ever machines and would have a production run of some 11 years, ending in 1964 following the production of 130,000 models. The CZ Manit and CZ. Manit was part of the nationalised Czechoslovakian industry, just like CZ and Jawa. The machines were manufactured in Pavojska in Bistria in the former Czechoslovakia between 1948 and 1967. The company's production was focused almost entirely on scooters that produced just one single conventional motorcycle. The first model was the Manet 90. It was powered by an 88cc two-stroke single-cylinder engine designed by Vincenz Sklerner. 
and was in fact their most popular model. The 90 would be followed by the Manus S100, which is said to be capable of 100 miles to the gallon. And this model was followed by the Tatran 125, and it was around this period, shortly after the introduction of the Tatran, that the company was taken over by Jawa. And it was in this period that the 98cc 4-speed Manus S100 was sold in the UK, but was marketed as the Jawa Manet. Manet, of course, having been absorbed by Jawa by that point. The CZ was manufactured by CZ between 1957 and 1964. And the great thing about these bikes is that very unusual styling. There's a real look of Dan Dare, or the kind of thing George Jetson would write to work on. People of this period were really obsessed with space travel in science fiction. I think this really shows in the design of the Suzetta. From the moment you first see this torpedo shaped machine, you know this is something different and something a bit special. For a start, it's two meters long, about six foot seven. The first machines used CZ's own 175 single cylinder two stroke engine. This gave a top speed of around 55 miles an hour. To keep the engine cool, the machine had a fan which was driven by a pulley on the end of the engine via a V belt. The first model released was the 501. This featured 6 volt electrics, conventional kickstart only, and had an unusual swinging arm arrangement at the back where the rear wheel was only supported on one side. And production of this model ran between 1957 and 1959. This was followed by the 502, which ran more conventional suspension front and rear. And this model featured 12 volt electrics and an electric starting too. Well, as an option at least. Amazingly, the machine could even be supplied with a sidecar, although I'm not sure how quickly the bike would go with two people on board, but nevertheless around 900 of the machines were sold. An interesting and slightly unusual note to the story is that during the 60s, around 4,000 bikes were actually produced in New Zealand under licence. In 2017, a limited production run was begun for the CZ 506. This used an electric motor and replaced the old two-stroke. The electric motor and its systems were designed by a British expat Neil Eamon Smith, who said that he intended to build the world's most desirable scooter, and given that only 60 were intended to be built, it would also make it the world's rarest electrical scooter. And by EV standards, the performance was fairly respectable too, with a top speed of some 75 miles an hour. What collections of bikes would you like to see featured in a video? Or perhaps you own a bike that you'd like to see as test ride? Either way, drop us a line below. I do hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.